Treason, the act of betraying one's country, is the only crime defined by the Constitution. The framers of the Constitution chose to explicitly define treason in order to prevent the federal government from using treason charges to oppress political opposition, as had been done in England. Accordingly, they crafted a narrow definition of the crime. The Constitution declares that treason shall only consist of levying war against the United States or providing aid and comfort to America's enemies. Additionally, the Constitution provides protections for those accused of treason. The accused can only be convicted if two witnesses testify to the same overt act of treason or if the accused confesses to the crime in court. Because of how difficult it is to indict and convict someone of treason, there have only been a handful of treason cases in all of American history. The first cases were related to the Whiskey Rebellion. In order to pay off debts from the American Revolution, Congress imposed a tax on whiskey. This proved incredibly unpopular amongst farmers, and in western Pennsylvania, farmers violently rebelled against enforcement of the tax. President George Washington led militiamen to suppress the rebellion, which collapsed without a fight. Most rebels escaped prosecution thanks to a lack of evidence, but a handful were charged with treason. District Attorney William Rawl claimed that by combining forces to resist a federal law, the rebels had levied war against the United States. Rawls' expanded definition of treason was used to successfully prosecute two rebels, John Mitchell and Philip Weigel, who were sentenced to be hanged. However, Washington pardoned these men, as well as the other rebels who were still being prosecuted. Washington believed in using moderation and tenderness in dealing with civil unrest, and thought the pardons were in line with his belief. Washington's successor, John Adams, dealt with a similar rebellion. During Adams' presidency, tensions between the United States and France were high, prompting Congress to raise an army and expand the navy. To fund this, Congress imposed a tax on real estate and slaves. Many refused to pay the tax, deeming it despotic and unconstitutional. In Pennsylvania, several tax resistors were arrested, and hundreds of armed resistors, led by John Fries, assembled to free them. Fries negotiated the release of the prisoners without bloodshed, but upon learning of Fries' rebellion, Adams ordered it to be suppressed with military force. The rebellion soon collapsed with little resistance, and Fries and two others were put on trial for treason. William Rawl prosecuted these men, again arguing that combining forces to defy a federal law constitutes treason. All three men were convicted and sentenced to be hanged, but Adams pardoned them and everyone involved in the rebellion because he believed that order was restored and further prosecution was unnecessary. Adams was succeeded as president by Thomas Jefferson, and Jefferson's first vice president, Aaron Burr, was accused of treason. Burr allegedly conspired to carve out his own nation in the western United States and apparently assembled soldiers and weapons at Blennerhaza Island for this purpose. However, the Burr conspiracy was unveiled when one of Burr's co-conspirators, General James Wilkinson, informed Jefferson of the plot, though without naming Burr. The Ohio militia raided Blennerhaza Island, and eventually, Burr was arrested and charged with treason for levying war against the United States. Prior to Burr's trial, the Supreme Court took up a case involving some of his co-conspirators. In ex parte Bowman, the court declared that levying war against the United States requires an actual act of war, not just enlisting men to wage war. This ruling narrowed the constitutional definition of treason to Burr's advantage, as he hadn't yet waged any war. Additionally, Burr hadn't been present on Blennerhaza Island during the raid. This made it essentially impossible to satisfy the Constitution's requirement that two witnesses testify to an overt act of treason. The prosecution failed to prove Burr had committed an act of war on Blennerhaza Island, and thus he was found not guilty. In the following decades, the United States expanded westward, bringing it into conflict with Mexico. During the Mexican-American War, American troops occupied northern Mexico and set up the New Mexico Territory. Many of New Mexico's Hispanic and Puebloan inhabitants were angered by the occupation, and in Taos, they rebelled. The rebels killed New Mexico's governor and many others who supported the occupation, but after clashing with the American army, the Taos Revolt was put down. Many rebels were tried for murder, and a few were indicted for treason. While the rebels were Mexican, not American citizens, prosecutors claimed the U.S. had liberated them from Mexican oppression, and thus they owed allegiance to the United States. By rebelling, prosecutors claimed they maliciously subverted the law and the Constitution. The jury, which consisted of many friends and associates of the slain governor, swiftly convicted the rebels, who were sentenced to death. At least one rebel was executed for treason, the first such execution under the Constitution. After the Mexican-American War, tensions between the North and South over slavery rapidly mounted. As a response, Congress passed a series of laws known as the Compromise of 1850. One of these laws, the Fugitive Slave Act, was deeply unpopular in the North as it required all citizens to aid in the capture of escaped slaves. In 1851, a slave owner led a group of people from Maryland to Christiana, Pennsylvania to capture four escaped slaves. Upon reaching a fugitive slave's home, the group was confronted by a larger group of African Americans who told them to leave. The Marylanders refused and a fight broke out between the two groups, resulting in the slave owner's death. Following the Christiana riot, 42 people were charged with treason, and the first to stand trial was Kastner Hanway. 
Prosecutors argued Hanway levied war against the United States by combining with others in a warlike manner to prevent the execution of the law. The defense claimed the clash did not rise to the level of treason, and that the prosecutors were using the threat of treason charges to frighten people into complying with the Fugitive Slave Act. In this case, the expanded definition of treason failed, as Hanway was found not guilty, and the charges against the other 41 people were dropped. The Christiana riot further inflamed the sectional conflict in America, contributing to the Civil War. Southern states, afraid that slavery's continued existence was under threat, seceded, forming the Confederate States of America. The Confederacy waged war against the United States, a seemingly clear act of treason. During the war, the Union heavily cracked down on supposed treachery. In Union-occupied New Orleans, William Bruce Mumford tore down an American flag. As a result, Mumford was charged with treason, found guilty, and executed. However, Mumford was one of the few Confederates to ever be indicted for treason. Every Confederate soldier and official could have reasonably been indicted for treason, but in the name of national reconciliation, President Andrew Johnson granted most of them amnesty. Even if they were tried for treason, Southern juries likely wouldn't have convicted them. Confederate President Jefferson Davis was excluded from Johnson's amnesty and faced treason charges, but the charges were eventually dropped. Prosecutors were afraid Davis's trial would devolve into a debate over the legality of secession. They also feared a Southern jury would acquit Davis, thus legitimizing the Confederacy. In 1868, Johnson pardoned all former Confederates of treason, ending the possibility of prosecution. Throughout the war, several Northerners were also accused of treason. A group called the Sons of Liberty, a secret society consisting of ardently anti-war Democrats, operated in the Old Northwest in collaboration with Confederate agents. They planned on sabotaging the Union war effort to end the war in the Confederacy's favor, but their plot was discovered before it could be carried out. Multiple members were convicted of treason by a military commission in Indiana and sentenced to death. One of the men, Lambden Milligan, claimed his conviction was unlawful, arguing that the Constitution guaranteed him the right to a jury trial. Milligan never served in the military, and he lived in Indiana, a state which was not in rebellion. Because of this, Milligan believed the military commission had no jurisdiction over him. The Supreme Court heard his case in ex parte Milligan, and in a landmark decision, the court sided with Milligan, declaring that, so long as the civil courts were available, military trials of civilians were unconstitutional. In the end, Milligan walked free. The next treason trials were byproducts of World War II. Several Americans sided with Germany, such as Mildred Gillers, better known as Axis Sally. Gillers worked as a Nazi radio propagandist and broadcasted discouraging messages to American troops. After Germany's defeat, Gillers was captured and charged with treason. At her trial, she claimed she was a patriotic American, but she was convicted nonetheless, serving 12 years in prison before being released on parole. Although Gillers was the most infamous, multiple other Americans worked as radio propagandists for the Nazis. They too were convicted of treason and were sentenced to prison terms of varying lengths. Another American, Anthony Kramer, was accused of treason due to his association with a German saboteur. During the war, several German saboteurs were sent to the United States. Kramer met with one of these saboteurs on several occasions and held onto a large sum of cash for him. In doing these things, Kramer apparently provided aid and comfort to the enemy, and thus he was convicted of treason. However, although the prosecution provided the constitutionally required two witnesses to convict Kramer, their testimony did not show that he aided the saboteur in his mission in any way whatsoever, only that they had met and Kramer received money. As Kramer and the saboteur had been business partners before the war, these activities could reasonably be interpreted as completely ordinary. This may have been the case, as their meetings had been in public over drinks. Kramer appealed his case to the Supreme Court, which reversed his conviction. The court declared that, to be convicted of treason, the two witnesses must testify to an act which actually provides aid to the enemy. This testimony cannot be used to just imply or imagine treason. The Supreme Court revisited this ruling a few years later in Haupt v. United States. Hans Haupt, a naturalized citizen from Germany, was convicted of treason for providing aid and comfort to his son, who had worked for the Nazis as a saboteur. Haupt sheltered his son, helped him find a job, and bought him a car. He appealed his conviction to the Supreme Court, arguing that these were ordinary acts a father would do for his son. However, the court rejected this argument based on the Kramer ruling. Unlike Kramer, Haupt's acts actually provided aid to an enemy saboteur, helping his son in his mission. Haupt also claimed the prosecutors had used a confession he made out of court against him, violating the Constitution's mandate that only confessions made in court could be used. The Supreme Court rejected this argument too, deciding that because a basis for prosecution was established with the necessary witnesses, out-of-court confessions were admissible as corroborative evidence. The court upheld Haupt's conviction, and after a stint in prison, he was deported to Germany. There were also many Americans who were accused of aiding Japan during the war. Like Germany, Japan broadcasted demoralizing propaganda to American troops. Although multiple Japanese women were responsible for these broadcasts, American troops blamed a single person, who they called Tokyo Rose. 
After the war, one Japanese-American, Eva Taguri Dakino, was accused of being Tokyo Rose. Dakino had been in Japan when the war started and, unable to leave, she took up a job broadcasting messages to American troops. With the public now clamoring for her prosecution, she was convicted of treason. However, Dakino only broadcasted music, not propaganda, and she even used the broadcasts to secretly encourage American troops. Although Dakino was stuck in Japan during the war, she was proud to be an American citizen and refused to renounce her citizenship, despite being punished for this. Additionally, it was found that the two witnesses who testified against her had lied under oath due to pressure from the prosecution. As it became clear that Dakino had been wrongfully convicted, President Gerald Ford granted her a pardon. Tomoya Kawakita was also accused of betraying America to aid Japan. Kawakita, a dual citizen of both countries, lived in Japan during the war, and while working for a Japanese company, he brutally abused American prisoners of war who were forced to work for the company. When the war ended, Kawakita was tried for treason, but he claimed he renounced his American citizenship before committing the acts he was accused of. If this were true, he would not have owed any allegiance to the U.S. because he was neither a citizen or a resident, and thus he could not be charged with treason. However, the jury determined that he had been a citizen, and he was convicted and sentenced to death. Although Kawakita appealed his case, the Supreme Court upheld his conviction. The court declared that all American citizens, regardless of dual citizenship or place of residence, owe allegiance to the United States and can be charged with treason. Since World War II, only a single person has been charged with treason, Adam Gadon. Gadon converted to Islam and moved to Pakistan in 1995, where he worked as a propagandist for Al-Qaeda, an Islamist militant organization. Al-Qaeda carried out a series of attacks against the U.S., and after Al-Qaeda conducted the attack on the World Trade Center, President George W. Bush launched the War on Terror with Al-Qaeda as a major target. Gadon, calling himself Azam the American, appeared in several propaganda videos where he denounced the United States and called for further attacks against it. Although Gadon was indicted for treason in 2006 for providing aid and comfort to Al-Qaeda, he never stood trial as he was killed in a drone strike in 2015. The Supreme Court's decision in the Kramer case has often been cited as being the reason why treason cases have been so rare since World War II. While the Kramer ruling restricted the witness requirement, it also, more importantly, declared there was nothing stopping the government from prosecuting potential traitors for other similar, but easier to prove, crimes. There was some discussion around whether the participants in the January 6th Capitol attack committed treason. Even so, none of them have actually been charged with the crime, possibly because of it being easier to secure convictions for lesser crimes. This all may make it seem like the treason clause has only become increasingly irrelevant. However, it's worth noting that treason cases were meant to be rare, reserved only for the most undoubtedly deserving occasions. Because treason charges are so rarely used and so difficult to prove, they carry additional weight. Even when treason charges are arguably justified as punishment, they should only be used when they are inarguably necessary to achieve justice. After all, the Constitution defines treason not to encourage prosecution, but to protect people from being accused of committing treason against the United States.